follow-up research on that is something that still gives me chills. Um, and I, I learned about this decades ago, and it's, it, I, I think it's m among the most fascinating results in cognitive neuroscience. Justine Surgent was a researcher at McGill in Montreal, uh, worked uh, like uh, about 20 years after Sperry. And she studied people with split brain surgery. And what she did was she found a way to present pictures of things, like pictures of arrows, to each hemisphere separately at the same time. So she put arrows up that the right hemisphere would see one arrow, the left hemisphere would see the other arrow, but no part of the brain saw both arrows. One half saw one arrow, the other half saw, saw the other arrow. And she asked the people, are the arrows pointing in the same direction or not? And they always got it right. But how, do, how could they compare arrows when no part of the brain saw both arrows? So she concluded that there was something in the mind that wasn't in the brain. Yer Pinto has um, furthered that research um, in which he tells stories to split brain patients, where the first half of the story is presented to one hemisphere. The second half of the story is presented to the other hemisphere. But you don't understand the story unless you see both. A good example would be if it, the left hemisphere gets a, can see a baseball and the right hemisphere can see a broken window. So Pinto would ask the patient, what happened? And the patient's always answered, the baseball broke the window. But no part of the brain saw both the baseball and the window. So there's something in the mind that's not in the brain. Wilder Penfield also studied free will. And he did a very, inter very interesting study. During these awake brain operations, he would stimulate the surface of a patient's brain. And if you stimulate the right place, you can make them do things, like make them raise, raise their arm. He would ask them during the surgery to occasionally raise their arm themselves without him stimulating them. And you can't feel your brain. Your brain has no sensory things, and the patients are under surgical drapes. So they can't see what he's doing. And he would ask them, when your arm goes up, I want you to tell me whether you did it or whether I did it. And they always got it right. Hundreds of thousands of trials of this in 1,100 patients. No one ever missed it. No one ever got it wrong. And he concluded then that he couldn't find any place in, in the brain that simulated free will. That free will wasn't in the brain. That you could always tell, this is my will. This is not someone doing it to me. So free will is not a brain function. Benjamin Leibitt did probably the most famous research on free will. And what Leibitt found, and it, it, it would take a while to go into details about how he did his, his experiments. They were, they were quite, quite, quite ingenious. But he would record electrical signals from the scalp. And these are people who haven't had any surgery. They're just normal volunteers. And what he found was that when you decide to do something simple, there tends to be a spike in brain activity that happens about a half second before you decide. Like if, 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 if you're going to turn on a light switch. About a half second before you turn on the light switch, your brain spikes. And that's before you're aware that you're going to turn it on. So what, and that seems at first glance that everything is driven by your brain. Your brain makes, makes you do it, and you don't really have any free will. It's all just chemicals driving you to do things. But he was a very clever researcher, and what he did is he asked people to veto your decision. That is, that when you're about to flip the switch, say, no, I'm not going to do it. I've changed my mind. And the veto didn't have a spike in the brain. So he said, it's not so much that, that he showed there was free will, but they showed there was free won't. <laughs> that is, that your brain, and, and, and he, he commented, he was, he was a religious man, and he said, this is the traditional um, religious way of understanding human motivation, that we're hit with temptations from our brain, but we have the free choice to do it or not. Because the free choice to do it or not did not have any new brain activity at all. It was independent of the brain. So the brain keeps hitting you with these things, have that extra piece of cake. <laughs> but you can say yes, uh, yes or no, and you can't blame your brain. 
Adrian Owen is a researcher, um, I think he's currently in Indiana, he was at Cambridge in England, did a fascinating study um, in patients in persistent vegetative state. Persistent vegetative state is the deepest level of coma. Uh, it's just a step above brain death. And it happens when people have had very severe brain injuries from, from uh, lack of oxygen or from, uh, from motor vehicle accidents. And um, it, it's called vegetative because it's, a, it's been assumed that these people are basically vegetables, meaning that they, they have no mind. They're just a body and there's no mind left. Um, it, 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 some of you may recall the, the Terry Schiavo stuff that went on about 20 years ago. She was in persistent vegetative state. What Owen did is he put uh, patients in MRI machines and did functional MRI imaging that shows brain activity. And he would ask them to think about things with, he with, with, a, with a headset. He'd say, think about walking across the room or think, think about uh, your family or, thinking about, or think about playing tennis. And they would show patterns of brain activation in, in their very damaged brain. And he then did that with normal volunteers and found the patterns were identical, implying that they were understanding what he was talking about. And then what he did, and he was very clever, he asked the same questions, but he mixed up the words so they didn't make any sense. Instead of uh, think about walking across the room, he'd say room across walking about think. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense. And the brain was silent. So these people were understanding the questions he was asking, even though their brains were practically destroyed. And he actually found, he and others, other people have, have replicated his work, that about 40% of people in, in persistent veg, vegetative state show clear evidence of being able to communicate. There are people who can do mathematics in persistent vegetative state. You ask them, what's nine plus six? You count, when you hit 15, the brain lights up. Uh, there are people who can tell their family histories. You know, is your brother's name George? The brain will light up. So um, you can communicate with people in the deepest level of coma in, in many cases. Near-death experiences are sort of the paradigmatic example of um, a, a separation between the, the soul or the mind and the brain. And while some near-death experiences may be not genuine, they may, they may be hallucinations or, or whatever, uh, there's no doubt that there is a real core of real experiences. Uh, they're, they're probably about 20% of near-death ex experiences um, are veridical, meaning they can be checked. The person knows things that occurred when they were dead, things that went on inside the room, et cetera. Uh, the probably most famous near-death experience was Pam Reynolds, who was an aneurysm uh, patient, operated on in 1991. And in order to safely operate on the aneurysm, her surgeon had to stop her heart after cooling her body down to about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, that gave him about 30 minutes to fix the aneurysm. He drained all the blood out of, out of her brain, fixed the aneurysm, and then rewarmed her and started her heart again. And she survived and did very well, actually. She said that in the recovery room, she said, you know, I watched the operation. He said, what? <laughs> you, know, she's, uh, you, you were brain dead. You couldn't possibly watch the operation. So she said that as soon as her brain went dead, she popped out of, out of her body, floated up to the ceiling, watched the surgery. She said that her vision was amazingly accurate, and it was a beautiful scene. And then she told him what he talked about during the surgery. She told him what the instruments looked like and what music was playing in the room during the surgery. Um, and things like this have happened a number of times. Uh, so in my view, there's, there's no question that some near-death ex experiences are very real. Uh, the other thing that for me is very convincing is that people have surveyed the literature, and there are thousands of, of examples of this in the literature, where people go down a tunnel and they see uh, loved ones and relatives at the other end of the tunnel. Nobody in the medical literature who's had a near-death experience has ever seen a living person at the other end of the tunnel. It's not like you kind of want your mother and your mother's still alive and you see her at the other end of the tunnel. Only dead people are at the other end of the tunnel, including people that you didn't know were dead. There are a number of examples of people who were in car accidents where someone in the car died and they didn't know the person died because they were critically injured also and they saw that person on the other side of the tunnel, but not people in the car who didn't die. 